see so many more people come back slowly. Um, and like Josh already said, Pastor Homer is gone and Alex is gone and a lot of other people are gone. And so to kind of go down the list. So <laughs> one guy's always one guy's always here, never goes anywhere. And so, um, but, but it is, you know, actually it is, it is nice to be able to, to come up and share um, with you again. And, and you know, I, I thought for so many of us, um, so much of our lives really revolve around school calendars. And I know it's not like that for everybody, but just for so, so many of us, it just, it seems like whether you've just graduated from university, whether you've just taken a new job, whether you've just moved to Taiwan to work in a school, even if you're in a bushipan and, and somehow, you know, your schedule is just so different in the summer than it is during the regular school year. And even if you're working in some company or something and you have kids or your colleagues have kids, just it seems like life always changes once the school year starts again. Now, I've always been in schools, um, thank you, um, or worked in schools uh, almost my whole life. I did um, growing up, and of course, I went to school, believe it or not. Uh, and then I worked in schools, and, uh, and um, if we have kids now. And so what I like about that is that it seems like we, we who are connected, our schedules are connected to schools, we always get a second chance to start something, right? Because by August, we've forgotten everything from January 1st that we wanted to, you know, the new year and, and all the new cool things we were going to do this year, how we were going to get our whole life together. And, and then, you know, come January 5th, we say, well, that was next year's plan, actually, not this year's, or according to the moon calendar, not the other calendar. And, and we come up with ways how it just kind of all doesn't work out. But come August, those of us who are connected to schools, we kind of get a second chance. And we say, okay. This school year, I know it's been summer vacation, and I know it's been a long, and for some of us, those summer vacations just seem longer and longer. As the kids get older and want more to do, they just, you know, it just seems like a long time. And we come back from that and we say, okay, we know the kids have been watching too much TV, but this school year, we're going to change that. And we know that last year we were so stressed out because we tried to do all these things, this school year, we're just going to say no to a lot of things and just learn to say no and just be more in control of our own time and our calendar. And, and, and you know, maybe the playing, the kid, you know, my kids still don't play an instrument. It's terrible. You know, they're 13, 11, and 9, and they still don't play an instrument. But so this year, they're for sure going to learn an instrument. I'm just going to make that a priority. Going on dates with my wife, I'm going to make that a priority. You know, and all of these things where you say, this is the year where we're finally going to pull it together. It's all going to work out. And that's what I like about having kind of a second start. And so what I want to look at today, and, and, and yes, uh, Pastor Homer did say this was kind of the start of a new series on simplicity. Um, and we'll, 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 we'll get to that at the very end. Okay, I'm going to talk about a few other things and we're going to pull it in together at the very end. But I think for all of us, it's fair to say that what we want to do is we want to, in our personal lives, in our family life, in our career, we want to do something that we typically call pursuing excellence. Now, I know some of you who aren't in business, you really don't like that, and all this business terminology s sneaks in, but, but I'm just going to use that phrase, pursuing excellence, and it just means that we want to do a, a, a bit of a better job in our own lives and in our families, and we just want to kind of raise the bar a little bit, okay? But instead of repeating that whole phrase again, I'll, I'll just use the phrase pursuing excellence, and, and apologies to those who are not in business and you don't like that phrase, but that's just the word that we're going to use to keep it simple here. And so what I want to look at, though, at the beginning of this school calendar year is I'm going to look at that a little bit differently. And, and again, remember, I'll pull it to, OB, uh, to simplicity later on as we get towards the end um, of, 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 this, of, this, of this talk today. Um, we're going to look at the life of Joshua, because Joshua is actually an amazing person, and if we actually look at his life very, very carefully, I think we can see some incredible lessons and parallels that we can draw to our own life especially if we look at the beginning of Joshua's leadership over Israel, um, and, and just take some of those principles. Of course, we can't take all of them, and there's just so, so, so many in there. Um, but if you read through Joshua 1, 2, 3, 4, it's just amazing what's in there. So many times we read through that, we skim through it, and we just get stuck on the, the verses, be strong, be courageous, don't be afraid, I'll be with you. Be strong, be courageous, don't be afraid, I'll be with you. And it says that three or four times, 
um, in those first four chapters. And, and those are good verses. Please, I'm not, I'm not saying those aren't good verses, but, but there's just so much more there that we can look at. But what I want to do then today is I want to look at the context of this first few chapters in Joshua. Um, we're going to pray. I'll read scripture, uh, and then I'll try to just pull out some of the lessons that I've learned. And, and please know that what I'm sharing today Boy, I'm the first person that really needs to pay attention to that. So I'm just sharing some of the things that God's taught me. I told the crowd last, well, it wasn't a crowd, the handful of faithful <laughs> who come on Saturday nights. Hey, they got out at 6.03 last night. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, it's more just sharing some of the things God has taught me so we can just encourage each other and help each other as we're trying to uh, please God in how we live in the day to day. So here's the context. Um, and I don't know, I'm assuming most of you are somewhat familiar with some of the Old Testament Bible stories, but if you're not, it's okay. Here's what's happened. You can learn. It's not, you need to learn. Not, it's not okay, but you need to learn these things. And so you have the Israelites who have been in Egypt for 400 years. And, you have mo and they'd gone down there. Only a group of 70 people went down there. When Joseph was down there, he brought his father down, all of his brothers. So 70 people went down there. And over 400 years, the people of Israel really grew. Because you remember that even before that, God made a promise to Abraham. And God actually made two promises to Abraham. The first promise God made to Abraham was, I will make you and your descendants a great nation. That's one promise. The second promise, and I think it's a very distinct promise. There's some overlap, but it's very distinct. Through your descendants, all people will be blessed. Through you, all people will be blessed, which refers to Jesus, okay? And so what happened then is that as the people of Israel were in Egypt, they actually grew and grew and grew. You can't have a great nation with a lot of people. I can't stand up here and say, I've declared the nation of Mauer, that's my last name, and even though it rhymes with power, we're not very powerful because there's only five of us. And, and so, you know, you need a certain number of people to be a great nation. And so there come, they, but the new Pharaoh came, they became slaves, Moses took them out of Egypt, and they were just about to go into the promised land, which God had promised to them, all the way back from Abraham when he said, you're going to be a great nation because you need land to be a great nation too. And, and, and they said, oh, no, 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 too many giants, we can't do it. And so God was upset at them, and they walked around for 40 years in the desert. And they got the Ten Commandments, which is the rule of law that a great nation also needs. And, and so God was still, even though there's 40 years of desert, God was still piecing his plan together this whole time. And so now they get to the eastern side of the Jordan River. Now, I should have put a map up. I'm really sorry about that. I used to teach geography, so I just assume everybody knows what the Middle East looks like. So just smile and nod when I talk about East and West and Jordan and Mediterranean and all that. But on the eastern side of the Jordan River is where there were several tribes already that the people of Israel had already conquered. And two and a half of the tribes of Israel asked Moses and said, can we please just stay here? And Moses said to them, okay, but you're going to have to go across the river with us too and conquer the rest of the land. You can leave your, 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 your animals and your, your wives and your kids over here, but you men have to go back and conquer the rest, and then you can come back to this area. And so now all of the people of Israel are on the east side of the Jordan River. Okay, So if you look at a map, the east side is the right side. There's a Jordan River right here. And so they're, they're waiting there. They're waiting to cross over, over a million people by this time. Moses also, please remember, has just died because Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land because he disobeyed God in a very, very small instance. Remember, God said, God, God said speak, and he struck, and, 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 and it was something, it seems so small that that's why Moses wasn't allowed to go in. It's a significant thing, though, for us to look at later. Okay, so Joshua then, context still, is declared to be the leader of Israel. We have those great verses in Joshua 1 about being strong, having courage, God's with you. And the amazing thing in this is, is that God tells them to be, have, be strong, to have courage, he's with them. But then at the end of chapter 1, I think it's verse 18, all the people say to him, be strong, be courageous, we'll follow you, we'll obey you, we'll follow you just like we followed Moses. Now, they have probably forgot how the disobedient they were to Moses in the prior 40 years as well, but you know, you just remember the good stuff anyway. Most of us just remember the good stuff. And, and they said, we'll follow you just like that. And so this is a time where Joshua is really, you know, hey, we're finally in the promised land, I've become the leader, Everybody, I mean, imagine you go to your company, you have a morning meeting, and everybody in the company, or in your classroom, even better, says, we're going to be strong, be, we're going to follow you, teacher, we're going to do 
everything you tell us to do all year, and we're going to just support you. Wow, I mean, what a great start that would be if life was really like that, okay? And so uh, this is where Joshua is at. And so Joshua in chapter 1, it, he also tells the people, hey, get ready. In three days, God is going to do something great. And so in cha Joshua chapter 2, it's really interesting how this little story just kind of slips right in between 1 and 3. Joshua chapter 2, that's profound, between 1 and 3 is 2. Um, the story of Rahab at, and Jericho and how the sp spies go over into Jericho. And you have this odd little story about a prostitute in Jericho and how she takes care of these men who are in there and hides them so they don't get killed. Um, but the point of the story is, is that they come back saying, hey, all of the kings, all of the people west of the Jordan are already afraid of us. They've seen what's happened on the east side of the Jordan. They have certainly have heard about this massive group of a million people wandering around the desert for 40 years. I mean, how can you not? All the traders that go by and they see this crowd of a million, I mean, they've They've, they're going to go somewhere eventually, right? They're not just going to sit there the whole time. Eventually, they're going to go somewhere. And so the people on the west side of the Jordan are already afraid. And so they come back from Jericho, um, and then we get to these verses right here in Joshua chapter 3, verses that we want to talk about today. That's our context. And when we look at Bible stories, especially the Old Testament, we always have to put things in the context so we don't just sweep in, you know, randomly pull things out and say, oh, I like this verse, let me apply it, okay? So that's the context that we're going to look at. Let me pray, and then we'll read some scripture. God, thanks so much for this day again. Thanks for your word. Um, Lord, as we look at these script, this scripture here, these verses, I pray that you'd help us to remember that it's you who can change our lives. And Lord, as we look at the beginning of a school year for so many of us, whether it's working in schools or our kids go to schools or colleagues have kids in schools or whatever it may be, Lord, I pray that you would help us to keep going to you and to your word. Thank you that your word can change us, and thank you that when your word goes out, it doesn't come back empty. I just pray you'd help us today that your Holy Spirit would really teach us um, and point out things in our lives um, that honor you, and we can rejoice in that, but also to point out things in our lives where we just need to um, adjust our lifestyles a bit so we can please you and, and honor you more fully. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're in Joshua chapter 3. And I'm going to start reading in, chap in verse 5 of Joshua chapter 3. And I won't read through all of chapter 3 and chapter 4. I'll read a few verses at the beginning, talk about some more context, and then read a few verses at the end. But here's what we have. So Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, this is the key verse I want us to look at, okay? Joshua 3, 7. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of Israel so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Now, I've never been to any kind of a Bible school seminary. I've never even taken an online course like that. And, and, and so I don't speak... Greek, Hebrew, Latin, Aramaic, or any of that. But I find it's really interesting when we actually go past just kind of reading a psalm every morning or at night just before we go to sleep to actually study a little bit more and dig a little bit deeper into Scripture. And one of the things that I found is really helpful is to get online and do one of those interlinear uh, Bibles, you know, where it actually has the English and then whatever language um, is connected to that. And, and the phrase, the word that I, I, I looked up in this um, is a pretty cool sounding word. And maybe you can remember this word. It's the word gadal. Um, gadal, G-A-D-A-L. And the word gadal is the word that's translated when God says, today I will begin to exalt you. So, so to exalt, this idea is the word gadal. Now here's what this word is used for. It's used for to advance, to boast, to bring up, to, make, to become excellent, to be, make greater, to increase, to lift up, to magnify. You see, it's always this word is always refers to when something is taken that's here and it's lifted up to another level. And so I, 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 I looked at that and I thought, wow, that's such a perfect word when we look at our own lives and say, hey, we want to take our lives, my personal, my family, my job, whatever it may be, and I say, hey, I want to just make it a little bit, you know, just, just to, to have it be a little bit more excellent, to gadal it a little bit, okay? So this is this connection here, that God says to Joshua, I will today, something's going to happen, and I will gadal you. So something great is going to happen on this day 
where Joshua is standing on the east side of the Jordan, ready to cross over. Now, what I want to do, oh, so what can we expect? Joshua is not just some ordinary person. Joshua has been with Moses in the desert. He's been his second in command. He's been a great warrior. He's done amazing things. He's fought battles. He's just not some guy who just kind of lives life kind of ordinary. And in and, and all of the things that Joshua had done, all the things that had happened in the previous 40 years or longer, God never once that we know of said to him, today I'm going to exalt you, today I'm going to get all you, today I'm going to make you excellent. Do you notice that? There's nothing that Joshua had done up to this point where God said, hey, today I'm going to make you great. People will look at you and you'll be exalted in their, I will exalt you in their eyes. Now I want us to jump to Joshua 4.14 because this is a verse right at the end. And it says this in Joshua 4.14. It's just one verse, so just hold on. The day the Lord, that day, sorry, that day the Lord exalted, that day the Lord gadal Joshua in the sight of all Israel. And they revered him all the days of his life, just as they had revered Moses. And so what we have is we have in Joshua 3, 7, was it 7? Yeah, 7, God says, today I'm going to exalt you, I'm going to gadal you. And then in Joshua 4.14, it says, Today, on this day, God gadal Joshua. So something in between these two verses has to happen that just has to be so spectacular that God would have placed Joshua and made him excellent in the sight of the people. Would you agree? I mean, God has never said anything about anything else in Joshua's life. So I want to go through this quickly. We're not going to read through all of this, but I'll go through this here and just tell you what happened specifically on that day. This is the day um, where they're standing. The first thing that Joshua does on this day is he organized the people and he told them to get ready. For some of you, that's a normal thing you do every day in your job. Okay, guys, get ready. You know, whether business or teaching PE or whatever it may be. So he just tells them, get ready. Something's going to happen. The second thing he does, so nothing spectacular yet, right? Second thing he does is he tells the priests to get ready, to take the ark, and he says to them, hey, when you get to the river, you are the ones who are going to go into the river. And so they do that. Now here's something really, really important. Joshua's just been, established, you know, he's just been appointed the leader. The people have confirmed that they want to follow him. It seems to me like one of the best signs or acts of leadership that Joshua could do at this time would be to, as the leader, step into the raging Jordan River first. Don't you think? And then everyone would say, wow, look how brave and courageous this guy is. He's the one who stepped into the river first. But if you remember back up in chapter 3, God says, when you get to the river, tell the priests to go in first. And, and something so small that would just make so much more sense, if you read a lot of leadership literature, you know, you have to go first, you have to hold the flag, this whole thing, leadership from behind, doesn't work too well. You know, all of these things, you know, that, 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 that's what you should do. And yet Joshua tells the priest to go in first. Now we read in the Bible that the water, not just right there, but up quite a bit further, um, the, the, the river stopped flowing and, and a wall of water built up. Now, if a river stops flowing, for, when I lived in Germany for a few years when I was younger, you know, we would go into creeks, we'd dam up the river, the creek, and it would get higher and you'd kind of play and then, you know, a couple minutes later we were just bored and did something else. But, but it's not a few minutes that the river would stop flowing. It would have been hours and hours and hours because the entire over mil a million people would have had to cross. That's a lot of time to get people across the river. So further up in this town of Adam, that was you know, where, the, where the river was stopped flowing, this wall of this massive amount of water would have, been be would have built up there. Anyway, so the priests go in, the people go in next, and then he tells, when everybody's crossed, he tells people, 12 guys, one from each tribe, go back, pick up a rock, build a memorial, so that when kids later ask what happened, you can say, this is what God did for us. And then he tells everyone to get out of the river. And that right there is everything the Bible tells us happened on that day. So the day that God tells a mighty warrior, I will make you great, and at the end of the day says, today I made you great, all that happened on that day was he told the people to get ready, he told the priests to go in, People crossed after the priests, um, and it was the two and a half tribes that went in first, in front of all the people. They got the rocks, they made a memorial, 
and they got over the river, and then the water would have started flowing again. That, to me, just seems like such an odd thing that God would say, those events are the events where I'm going to exalt you, I'm going to gadol you, I'm going to make you great in front of the people. Now, let me do this. Let me pull together just um, two principles from this, that as we look at the beginning of the year, of just doing a little bit better job with our own lives, our families, our kids, or in our jobs. And then we're going to just, um, I'll take it one step further and just talk a little bit about um, simplicity because that is what this is supposed to be the first, this is supposed to be the first one on the series on simplicity. Um, but here's the first principle I want you to get from this. Number one, it is God who gadaled Joshua. It is God who made Joshua great. As we look at our own lives, as we look at our families, as we look at our jobs, we need to remember this. There are so many things we can do. do. There are so many th- books we can read. There are so many blogs we can write. There are so many things we can do. But the only thing that's going to work of us and our lives being taken up to another level is if God does that. And this is what Joshua saw. God was the one who exalted Joshua. It's not something that he did himself. Second principle here. Oh, so let's do this. Let's acknowledge that it's God who makes things excellent. The second thing, and this is the hard one, the second really important, important point here is obedience. Joshua really did not do anything spectacular on this day. He really, he really didn't. The people had already declared their loyalty to him at the end of chapter 1. He didn't need to win them over. They were already loyal. So Joshua, what Joshua did on that day is that he just simply obeyed God. And I think so many times for us, um, that's such a hard thing to get to, that we need to understand that in our lives, as, as we in business pursue excellence and our families, all of these things, we, we, we tend to always think, you know, when we, when we have these goals, we always look forward. But you know what obedience is? Obedience is actually looking back at standards that were created in the past. I can't be obedient to something my boss will tell me to do in three years today. You see, obedience is always looking back and being obedient to a standard that has been set in the past. And so we, we sometimes have such a hard time with this concept of obedience because we just so much dislike having to submit to someone else's standards someone else's rules. Let's look here briefly at Joshua 1, because I do want to talk about these verses um, about being strong and courageous. And I'll just read here. Um, I'll read from verse 5 all the way down to verse 9. It's just five verses. No one will, this is God speaking to Joshua now. No No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. It's interesting, you know, we remember these be strong, courageous verses, but I want to look at Joshua 1.8, because right after God says, says these things to Joshua, God actually gives Joshua three commands, and these are all, if you teach English, it's, these are all imperatives, and so an imperative just means it's to do something, okay, it's just I'm telling you to do something, and the three things that God tells him to do before he says, then you will be prosperous and successful, okay? Because we're still in this Gadol theme, to be prosperous and successful. The three things that he tells them to do is, number one, don't let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Now, in our culture today, there's a little bit less of us speaking God's word out loud. At that time, people would have spoken, and they, because not everyone would have had a Bible or an iPad, and so, you know, if you want to hear it, it's got to be read to you. And, and the whole concept here is to actually spend time in God's Word. Whether you're reading it yourself today, that would probably be a, a, more, a more accurate interpretation of this. At that time, it would have been more listening to someone else read it. But the whole point is that you're stopping what you're doing and you're spending time listening or reading 
God's word. You're in God's word. That's the first thing that God commands Joshua to do. Here's the second thing he commands him to do. He tells him to meditate on it. Now, today, meditation, you know, and I know depending on what culture you're from, there's so many different ways that we, we, we talk about meditation. But meditation, the way it's talked about in the Bible, is actually very simple. Is that you stop everything you're doing and you listen to the Holy Spirit. You don't listen to a waterfall. You don't listen to birds chirping. God's creation can lead you to praise Him. Absolutely. In fact, if God's creation doesn't lead you to praise Him, it really doesn't matter because they'll just praise Him themselves. Or it, creation will praise God itself. But the point of meditation is for us to stop and let only the Holy Spirit show us things in our lives to encourage us, to teach us, to rebuke us, whatever it may be. But it's that stopping and slowing down to listen to the Holy Spirit. Um, and I'm all for nature, so please don't misunderstand what I just said about waterfalls. But that's not what meditation in the Bible is about. It's about opening yourself up to hear God and God alone, not anything else. Third imperative, so the third directive he gives, he says, be careful to do everything written in it. So read God's word, meditate, and let the Holy Spirit change you after you've read God's word, and then do what the Holy Spirit has taught you to do. That would be a very simple way to take this verse and to apply it to our day to day. And if we do those things, then we will be prosperous and successful. Not necessarily the way everyone else sees it, but in the eyes of God. And so if we, if we look at our families today, if we look at our lives, if we look at our new teaching, you know, we may be starting in a brand new school this year, if we look at all those things, we have all these ideas of how we're going to make it just be a great, great, great year. Those are all good things, but at the core, at the core of, of God gadaling us, it takes us to stop and read God's word, to let the Holy Spirit change us, and then to be obedient to what the Holy Spirit says. And I, as I, as I, it seemed like, as I, and I'm not very old yet, I don't think, um, but uh, as I'm getting older, it seems like it's harder and harder to be obedient to other people. Because like, what is this, you know, come on, you know what I mean? Some of you have experiences, your boss is 20 years younger than you, and you're like, what, what do you know? You know, and it's like, oh, that just kills you sometimes, right? And, uh, um, uh, or it might be your younger brother. I don't know. Maybe some of you, your boss is your younger brother. And, and just like, it's just, but for me, it's so hard, it's so hard to just be obedient to, to what other people tell me to do as I get older, because I feel like I've established myself more and more. It's time for other people to come to me and start doing what I tell them to do. Um, and so we really, really, we really struggle with this. Now, Dave Homer gave me a book. Um, about obedience and, and about simplicity because I want to take all of this concept of obedience and simplicity and pull it together and then he'll take this, he'll take this further um, as he goes. But you know, let, let me, and, and I don't really like reading long quotes here, but I'm just going to read a little bit and I'll, and I'll read it hopefully in a way that you won't fall asleep as I do this, okay? And here's a, here's a, here's a quote. Um, It says this, there are plenty, and this is from a book called Freedom of Simplicity by a guy called Richard Foster, so I have to give credit where it's due. Uh, there are plenty that follow the Lord halfway, but not the other half. They give up their possessions, their friends, and honors, but it touches them too closely to disown themselves. So you know what? It's actually, and, and, and maybe in this group there's someone who's just become a missionary, and they're in Taiwan now as missionaries, or maybe you've said, hey, in my career, at Dell, wherever you work, I'm just going to be more intentional about living a life where I can share my faith with others. You see, it's actually sometimes a lot easier to give up the comforts that others see, but to never fully give up ourself to God. And I grew up as a missionary kid, and I, I've been around missionaries for a long, long, long time. And I would say, wow, that's so, so, so true for all of us. It might be easy to give up some of these, these things, say, okay, you know, I'm going to stop doing this because it's just it's a way that I can show obedience to God, but never really in our core, in our soul, submit our soul to him. Um, there's a verse, and I, it's funny because I, I actually, last time I was here speaking, um, we talked about this verse from Mark and is also in Matthew. If a man would follow me, he must deny himself take up his cross and follow me. And we talked about how when the picture of the cross is used in the Bible, it never refers to a difficulty. 
That's something else. The cross in the Bible always refers to death, not difficulty. It's not a cross for me to have to um, uh, deal with the hardships in my job or with an illness or with a child who's maybe ill. That's not... That, that's a burden you have to carry. But when the Bible talks about cross, the image always, always, always is that it's a death. And so a death that I have to die to myself again and again and again. Let me read you another part of this. We have, seen, we have failed to see this amazing paradox. True self-fulfillment comes only through self-denial. There is no other way. The most certain way to miss self-fulfillment is to pursue it. Matthew 10, 39 says, He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. It is wonderful, the losing of oneself through a perpetual vision of the holy. We are catapulted into something infinitely larger and more real than our petty existence. A blazing God consciousness frees us from self-consciousness. It is freedom, it is joy, it is life. I cannot stress enough how essential this quality is true simplicity of life. It is the only thing that will allow us to hold the interest of others above self-interest. It sa saves us from self-pity. It lifts the burden of concern over having a proper image. It frees us from bondage to the opinion of others. And again, that was Richard Foster. And so what's, what, what we're looking at here is that as we pursue excellence, we, we have to remember that the starting point for that is obedience. And I, I would say the comparison here, as we're looking at simplicity, the starting point for that is really also obedience. Because if we spend time in God's Word, if we let the Holy Spirit teach us and mold us, and if we are obedient to what the Holy Spirit has told us to do and what God teaches us, I think that we're able to think much more, uh, we're, we're much better to think about God things than just our own things. And, and what his greater plan and greater picture is instead of just what our own greater plan and picture is. And as I was thinking and talking with my wife about this whole concept of simplicity and wanting to have a more simple life, and, uh, and, uh, and some of you who know me know I, my life is anything but simple, and I just, I'm like a magnet for disaster. I, I, I've been my whole, my whole life, I've always been a magnet for disaster. It's just really, don't ever go anywhere with me because something <laughs> bad's going to happen. Um, and, and, and oh, I shouldn't say bad, just something interesting. Um, and you'll laugh about it six months later. But, uh, but, but as, as, as we look at how do, we, how do we bring this element of simplicity in our lives, you know what I thought? I think that we're really, that's not really what we're looking for. Because quite honestly, we have this, 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 this notion of simplicity as, you know, we kind of go back, well, things were just the way they were 100 years ago. Well, I'm really sorry. I don't want things to be like that. Things have never been simple. Our lives have never been simple. And 100, 200, 300 years ago, 50, 10 years ago, things really weren't simple either. I mean, just imagine when you were a teenager. Was life simple? Not really. Or 10, 20 years ago and before computer games. I mean, there's always, life has never really been simple. And so as I was thinking about that, I think what we're really looking for is not so much simplicity in our life, but a sense that our soul is well. Do you know what I mean? We're, we're really looking for this deep, deep sense of peace that comes from our innermost, from our soul, and being well in our soul, much less than coming up with seven things we're going to eliminate this year and three things we're going to add. And then when we do all that and follow all those rules really carefully and, and strictly, then our life will be so much better. That's just another layer of things being complicated on top of everything. And for people like me who are not very structured, it just, ah, it just irritates me just to think about more rules I have to follow. And, and so I think it really comes down to when we talk about simplicity, we just want it to be well with our soul. And, and as I've been looking at these scriptures, I've thought, you know what? The way for my soul to be well is to first of all remember, it is God who will exalt me in his time, in his way, and my family, and my job, or whatever is going on. It is God who's going to do that. And it is through obedience to him that I spend time in his word, intentionally, not just reading Psalm 23 every morning before I run out the door or in the car or on the subway, but that I spend time with him intentionally. I stop and let the Holy Spirit teach me 
I listen. I actually listen to God. I don't just read it and run. And then I obey what God's Word and the Holy Spirit has taught me. And if I do those things, I think what's going to happen is that wellness in my soul is going to be there. You know, there's that old, old hymn, when peace like a river attendeth my way. That means, and we just sing through this, but there's actually like a full stop. When peace like a river attends my way, stop. Or, doesn't say or, because it's not poetic. When sorrows like sea billows roll. You see, it talks about two completely different parts of life. When things are going well, and when things, oops, sorry, microphone. When things are not going well. And in those, I can say, it is well with my soul. If I stop pursuing the seven steps to simplicity, the seven steps to greatness, and I say, I'm going to read God's word, I'm going to meditate on it, and I'm going to be obedient to it. And I'm going to end on that. Let's pray. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just teach us to honor you. Help us to let go of all of these things, and even all the comparisons that we start the school year about whose kid read more books over the summer and all these things that are just really useless things um, in light of eternity. And I just pray you'd help us to be obedient, to read your word, to meditate on it, and then to do what you tell us to do. And that we would really, instead of focusing on all the outward things, that we would look at our souls, our direct, just what you've created, what will exist for eternity, and just make sure that our souls are well. And just out of that, just let your joy and your goodness grow and come out of that so we can make a, a difference in the lives around us. And Lord, I pray that's so hard for us to submit to your will and submit to your commands. Um, but I just pray, I pray that you would help us to have the humility to just let ourselves go, um, to put down our own desires, to pick up our cross, to die to our selfish desires, and to see what you would desire. And Lord, thank you that um, you, you want to change us and uh, you want us to have that, that, that wellness in our soul. I pray this in Jesus' name.